if the minister is going to join us. This meeting is being recorded. Hi, everyone. Dan Dyker, President of the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, sitting here with two my two esteemed two esteemed colleagues, Brigadier General Yossi Kuperwasser and Dr. Fina Ernstein from the JCPA in the heart of Jerusalem. And we're very, very honored today to have uh, a real uh, uh, distinguished uh, cast of uh, thought leaders, uh, former uh, senior international officials, and three very distinguished Iranian guests at this uh, continuation of the JCPA policy series on the path to a democratic Iran, supporting the Iranian people's quest for democracy and the urgency simultaneously for Europe to prescribe the IRGC. Uh, this is uh, <clears throat> the issue of the IRGC, the, the case of freedom and democracy for the Iranian people has been a subject of, of uh, deep concern and interest uh, for us for many years here at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. And this is a continuation today of the legacy of my predecessor, Ambassador Dr. Dory Gold, uh, who had written a best-selling book, The Rise of Nuclear Iran, and had made the Iranian issue, uh, both the prescription of the IRGC, as well as a pathway to freedom and democracy for the Iranian people, a major central focus of the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. And I'm very pleased and honored to say that we continue uh, that legacy and that tradition today which is the latest in a series of events, roundtables, workshops, briefs, uh, and, other, uh, and other diplomatic and strategic initiatives that we will have here at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs uh, in Jerusalem and abroad with our neighbors, allies, uh, and friends. Uh, I'm, very, I'm very honored that we'll, we are joined by Minister of Intelligence, State of Israel, Gila Gamliel, we're uh, also very, very proud and honored to, to have with us uh, former Italian Foreign Minister uh, Giulio Terzi and Ambassador uh, John Bolton, the former National Security Advisor to the President of the United States, former UN Ambassador and former Senior Official of the State Department, uh, one of the most knowledgeable experts in the United States on the Iranian issue and the IRGC specifically. I'd like to start with you, Minister Gamliel, and thank you very much for joining us uh, from your office. And the Minister Gamliel, would you share with us uh, your thinking in the next few minutes uh, about the importance of today's sort of dual, we're on a dual pathway, uh, Minister Gamliel. On the one hand, preparing a pathway uh, by prescribing the IRGC at the same time, looking forward to a, uh, to a free and democratic pathway for the people of Iran. Share with us a little bit of your thinking uh, as you open this uh, workshop for us. Thanks, Dan, and the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs for hosting this roundtable as we strengthen our support for the Iranian people. Today, I'm proud uh, to stand together with some of the West outstanding leaders of moral clarity on the Iranian people's quest for democracy and freedom. Giulio Terti, good to see you again, Italy. Italy's former foreign minister and uh, John Bolton. It's very good to see you here, former U.S. national security advisor and U.N. ambassador. Um, I want to tell you uh, that I'm very uh, happy that uh, you uh, join us. Have uh, have long led uh, both of you the international fight against the terror uh, ridden and the uh, nuclearizing regime in uh, Tehran. And together, on behalf of the free world, we urge our friends in the UK and EU to take a stand today for moral clarity and outlaw the IRGC. As I said in my recent address in the British House of Lords, moral clarity means that the UK and Europe, they both must to urgently and immediately proscribe the IRGC terror arm of the Iranian regime that holds the Iranian people of today hostage to terror and torture. And moral clarity also means showing the people of Iran solution-centric path to freedom and democracy for the Iran of tomorrow. Today, we are doing both. This dual call to prescribe today and prepare for tomorrow is a tall order, but it is possible, it is doable like you, you asked me to say. Today, the Iranian regime 
cruelly oppresses 88 million Iranian women, men, and children, and the regime exports terror, uh, subversion, and assassination across the Middle East, Africa, uh, Europe, and the, the Latin America. And today, the IRGC continues its attempted killing spree against leaders and political opponents in the United States and Europe. The IRGC attempted 15 assassination in the UK since 2022. As I mentioned last month, I was invited by my good friend, Lord Stuart Pollack, who is with us today, and member of parliament, Bob Blackman, to address colleagues from the British House to Com of Commons and the House of Lords. Together, we laid out the pressing dangers of the IRGC and called upon Prime Minister Sunak to proscribe the IRGC as the British Parliament had called upon him to do earlier this year. And just that this week, British Home Secretary Suela Braverman, she said that the Iranian regime's IRGC is the biggest threat facing the UK today. Today, I also call upon our dear friend, Italian Prime Minister Giorgia Maloney, my friend, and our friends across Europe to go beyond the tough EU sanctions imposed on the Iranian regime and proscribe the IRGC in their entirety. Dear friends, let me also emphasize what is unique about today and what creates optimism in me as an Israeli minister. Today we share the opportunity to pave a real shared path for the freedom of the Iranian people. What unites us today is an expression of unity by our three distinguished Iranian guests. Each one of them is a freedom fighter and thought leader who brings an individual perspective on how to reach a shared goal of a new morning for the Iranian people. And when I say new morning, please know that when Crown Prince Reza Pahlavi visited Israel a few months ago, it sent a message of freedom and hope to millions of Iranians everywhere. Today's Iranian speakers inspire hope. Mohsen Zanzagara, former Deputy Prime Minister of Iran. Marty Yosefani, a long time former Chief of Staff and Senior Advisor to Crown Prince Reza Pahlavi. And Vahid Beshti, a, a courageous activist who inspired millions in Iran with his stand and whom I met with in the UK last month, are all here together today and together is the key word. Mohsen, Marty and Wahid, each offers us a unique perspective on how we move from the cruel and dangerous Iranian regime of today to the free and democratic Iran of tomorrow. Dear friends, please know that the people of Israel stand firmly with the people of Iran, and time is of the essence. The Iranian regime marches forward, having already enriched uranium well beyond the 60% danger zone, violating all past promises to the international community, and is still enriching uranium on its way to 90% weapons grade. That is a red line in Israel. That's why our dual path of proscribing the IRGC today while presenting a vision for secure, stable, and prosperous, Iran is the right strategy at the right time for the rightful cause of the Iranian people. Thank you very much, and I look forward to hearing the broad perspectives on this very important roundtable consultation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Gamli. I deeply appreciate your opening thoughts uh, on this today's workshop. I want to just emphasize that what we're, besides the opening uh, comments by Minister Gamli, what we're trying to do today is to really have a conversation, a discussion. We have uh, a lot of, uh, of distinguished guests around the table. So what I'll do is ask a pointed question or two of each of our respondents uh, and, and ask them just to uh, address that question. 
Uh, and then immediately after, if there is a if there is a response by one or two, we, we can take that response. We're trying to keep everything very tight so that we can have a rich and fruitful discussion. Uh, in this workshop, which is being recorded, I want to mention to everyone that this is on the record. Unless you tell us that you want your comments specifically to be off the record, uh, we do have, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, from the international media uh, uh, with us today uh, on this uh, in this workshop. Um, I'd like to turn to uh, the Honorable Julia Terzi, uh, Santa Agata, uh, uh, Julio. Um, in our conversations offline, we talked about the urgency and the pathway in Europe, uh, uh, beginning with uh, uh, Italy, uh, with prescribing the IRGC. How do you see that pathway now as the stakes uh, increase every single day, the urgency and the intensity of the problems in the attempted assassinations by the RGC across the European continent. Thank you very much, Dan. And let me express immediately, immediately, a great appreciation for this opportunity, for the words that Minister Gamliel gave us today and the very timely and important initiative of JCPA. Yourself, uh, uh, Fianna Nierestein, uh, General Yossi Kuprovasser, for uh, talking and raising this issue among uh, with us uh, in this uh, very distinguished group. It is extremely important for me to start uh, with a, an expectation about uh, the, the conclusion of this meeting. So I'm sorry of starting with, with a sense of getting a group on conclusion, but I would like really to, to underline immediately that I sense the importance of this discussion to end with an appeal an appeal to all the EU member states and to the Italian government to come forward and to go straight to uh, the banning of the RGC, of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, as a main uh, objective of an action of foreign policy, which has to review the overall the complexity of European and each member state's relationship with Iran and also to address, to begin to address seriously, the global challenge, security challenge that Iran through the IRGC is bringing in Europe and other parts of the world. We are seeing that the attacks of the Russian aggressors are strongly helped by a deployment of drones, which are built uh, close to uh, the border of the Russian Federation, but with technology and so on. And that is a direct involvement by the Iranian uh, IRGC, especially and forces, with the aggression of the, uh, with the crime of aggression that the Russian Federation is perpetrating against an European country. It is true that the European uh, Commission, the European institution, have sanctions, a small number, four or five top guys in the IRGC structure who was directly connected with the production of drones. But that is far from being enough. We need to insist and to launch an appeal today and to continue in the next few days until we have uh, obtained our, um, uh, our uh, objective that IRGC in its entirety must be put on the blacklist of terrorist organization and the arm of a number one terrorist state in the world, but this is the uh, weaponized arm, the IRGC. This is the point that we wanted to make right away, and uh, let me agree uh, completely with the important elements and factual consideration which were forwarded by Minister Gamliel. Very short and sharp perspective. Uh, on, on the Iranian people's pathway to a, a future democracy, meaning what we're doing today, which is unique, is not only talking about the prescription of the IRGC, but it's, you know, what they say, Ma'ken, what, what's afterwards? What, what comes the day after? It is our responsibility. Our Western countries, the European Union, Atlantic, and the partners of uh, the Western world to be more engaged and to, to concretely support, of course, without meddling into Iranian affairs, but giving the clear sense to all the resistance forces which are active, which have been active over the last five, six years in the Iranian streets, who are paying with their life uh, heroic, the, an heroic strike, uh, an heroic struggle against the mullahs. The sense that there is a 
uh, unwavering support in Western countries, in our parliaments, in our governments, and that there is an alternative to this regime, a viable alternative. There are viable alternatives, but there is especially one or two alternatives which are represented by already very structured and experienced uh, uh, organizations of uh, dissenters, of people who are proposing an, a perspective of democracy, rule of law, denuclearization of the country, respect of human rights, parity. And uh, we, are, uh, we have been attending over the last uh, few weeks and a couple of months to very important gathering of uh, leading organizations, especially one leading organization to which uh, Ambassador Bolton, uh, the deputy, uh, uh, the former, uh, former vice president, American vice president, many other personalities did attend to emphasize the aspect that yes, there are huge forces in the Iranian society which are ready to continue their fight. They need to be supported politically and in every possible way to uh, bring security, freedom, peace to the Iranian people. Thank you very much, uh, Giulio, uh, uh, Ambassador Terzi, Foreign, Foreign Minister Terzi, very much uh, appreciate uh, your insights. I'm gonna turn to Ambassador Bolton as someone for decades who's been leading uh, the, the fight against the IRGC, against, uh, on behalf of the people of Iran. Can you give us a sense of what the range of options are for the West to undermine the IRGC? Uh, uh, and, and what is the challenge today uh, to, uh, you know, to the West, to the extent that governments are supporting or cooperating or, or acceding to the regime, what, what kind of uh, complicating factor does that create for the people of Iran? Right. Well, uh, Dan, thanks very much to you and the JCPOA. GC, there was a Freudian <laughs> slip, the JCPA. <laughs> For bringing this group together, and uh, it's a it's a it's an important topic, and and I'm happy to be able to participate. I think that uh, this question of dealing with the uh, uh, IRGC in in Europe, in particular, uh, is really right at the top of the agenda. But I do think it's important for any any of us who are concerned about the Iranian issue, whether we come at it from the perspective of the repression of the Iranian people, or we come at it from the concern about Iranian supported terrorism, or we come at it from the concern of their uh, nuclear weapons program, these things are all related. If you had to make a definition of a rogue state, it would be a state that represses its own people, pursues weapons of mass destruction, and international terrorism. That, that's Iran defined to a T. But they all fit together. And I think it's important to keep that in mind in discussions in countries as we uh, try to persuade them to put more pressure on the IRGC. I'll just offer, perhaps, if I may, a couple of points about what we went through in the United States to get to the point of actually designating the IRGC as a foreign terrorist organization under American law and what the implications are. Obviously, every country has its own statutory structure and, and uh, bureaucratic organization for dealing with the terrorist problem. And, and that in, is in of itself a complication for all of us. But in the U.S., uh, you know, uh, we, we had a head start in a way because uh, all the way back in the 1980s, Reagan had designated Iran as a state sponsor of terrorism, which uh, Iran was the first country to achieve that honor. Uh, and uh, it, it uh, opens up a range of sanctions against the government of Iran, uh, which we've deployed over the years, most of which are still in effect now. But to go the next step and designate the IRGC as a foreign terrorist organization, which you'll forgive me, I'll call an FTO, the abbreviation, uh, ran into real opposition within the US bureaucracy, uh, not so much in the country as a whole, but within the bureaucracy, because there were objections that, my goodness, uh, the original concept of an FTO was a group like Hamas or Hezbollah. Uh, a group of private citizens, not, not an actual government. And once you begin to designate elements of a government as an FTO, that calls into question their sovereign immunity, blah, blah, blah. You can imagine what the argument was. And we said, look, facts are facts. Our statutory definition of an FTO fits the Revolutionary Guards. And we overcame that objection. Then from the bureaucracy came objections that, my goodness, if you do that, Think of all the burdens you'll put on the bureaucracy. For example, 
uh, our Department of Homeland Security hand handles entry visas into the United States. And I sat uh, chairing a National Security Council principals meeting one day when the Secretary of Homeland Security said, do you know how many people we're now going to have to exclude from the United States if we declare the, the IRGC a terrorist organization? And the number was something fantastic because the definition of who gets excluded is very large. I said, this is an argument in favor of doing it, not an argument against doing it. But that's how our own bureaucracy was reacting. And then finally, the last line of defense was people pulling their hair out at this point saying, oh my goodness, don't designate the whole IRGC, just designate the Quds Force. Uh, as if designating the worst part, let's say, doesn't uh, doesn't uh, allow the Iranians to move the terrorist function into other parts of the IRGC. So I'm just saying within governments, I think Britain's a good example, if I can pick on them for a minute, the Foreign Office doesn't want to designate the IRGC. Uh, as a terrorist uh, group, because diplomats don't like to do that. I mean, somebody may designate the British Foreign Office as a terrorist organization one day, which I suppose they would if they were carrying out terrorist activities. So I just want to say we, we need to understand the peculiarities of each of the governments we're dealing with and lobby them effectively uh, in order to get to the right end. And then let, let me just finish with one quick point. Uh, that I think ought to focus uh, all of our thinking across the range here, dealing with the IRGC in particular, though, the opportunity for the pro-regime change, pro-democratic forces in Iran comes most acutely at the time the supreme leader, the Ayatollah Khamenei, dies. Uh, and I don't wish him any ill in particular, uh, other than that the actuarial tables take all of us to our maker at some point, and his will come in due course. They have only had one regime change in the Islamic Republic uh, when uh, uh, Khomeini died. There's no fixed structure for what the succession is. This will be the point when the government is most vulnerable and most fragile, and where the IRGC's role, unless we're pushing on it, could be dispositive. So, uh, not to slow down or speed up any activity, but I think this is something that may appear to be uh, remote. It could happen any day, and uh, we really need to be ready for it. Thank you, Ambassador Bolton. You know, the, your last point is a perfect transition uh, into uh, former Deputy Prime Minister Mohsen Sazagara, because he's been talking about uh, how, to, how we understand to get from theocracy to democracy in Iran, and and he's been leading that uh, he's been leading that concept, that idea. In fact, quoting in an offline discussion we had recently, quoted uh, Natan Sharansky's book, uh, "The Case for Democracy," in talking about double thinkers and uh, and uh, and how you get from uh, a fear society to a free society. So, uh, Mosin, uh, uh, um, your your Excellency Sazagara. Uh, please help us understand your thinking about how we get from theocracy to democracy in Iran as a, a continuation of the pathway uh, that begins with the IRGC but ends with a, with, a, with a much greater vision that you have been championing for, for many, many years. Uh, thank you, Dan, for having me. To thank you, everybody, and say hello again to uh, everybody. Uh, your question about how we can actually overthrow this regime, let's put it on this way, or uh, passing from uh, uh, transferring the country from present situation, the uh, theocracy, uh, uh, ideological, uh, radical version uh, uh, of theocracy to a democracy. Uh, definitely, we have chosen uh, the civil resistance way. Uh, when I say civil resistance, I mean a, a certain method that now I can call it knowledge of civil resistance. It's more powerful than any other uh, method to bring down the dictators and uh, the uh, tyranny. Civil resistance is based on three pillars, uh, protests, uh, paralyzing the regime and strikes uh, and other tactics, 
and defection from the regime. Uh, defection, uh, uh, especially from the uh, suppression machine of the regime, uh, when it reaches to the final stages. Uh, based on these three pillars that should move together, the tactics in uh, diversity of tactics should be divided uh, in uh, 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 all these three pillars and move together. Uh, I can't say that uh, during last year, better to say uh, uh, 11 months, uh, from start point of Gina uh, or, or Mahsa revolution or woman life liberty revolution that I insist to call it a revolution because uh, uh, the people have the, who have been marginalized in the politics of the country came together uh, in the scene uh, of the politics and asked for removing the regime uh, uh, and the ruler uh, rulers and rulership of the country. Uh, I call it by definition of some uh, uh, parts of uh, the, some uh, uh, so sociologists, they, I call it a revolution. What's going on in Iran is that uh, uh, deep in the society, uh, more than 90% of Iranian want to pass from this regime and reach a democracy. It has its uh, dominant discourse uh, at the heart of this revolution, uh, democrat democratic ideas, secularism, and uh, human rights. And going back to the family of the world, joining the trend of globalization in the world. These are the main dominant discourse of the uh, uh, society right now. Anyway, uh, to succeed, to uh, lead actually such a revolution toward victory, first of all, we should know the regime, how they are acting, how, uh, because uh, as Santezo says, that if you don't know your enemy, and know just yourself, 50-50%, you may win. But if you, you know your enemy and know your abilities, then you can go to the battlefield. Uh, we understand that regime, after uh, uprising last year, uh, after more than 120 days of street protests, decentralized street protests everywhere, they summed it up and found out uh, in a two important meetings with the top commanders of Revolutionary Guard and the top officials in uh, intelligence, because Iran has 17 different intelligence organizations. The leader uh, summed it up and they had a three parts uh, uh, strategy. First, they decided to uh, uh, reduce tension in the region with the countries in the region and uh, with the US and get some money. They targeted for $24 billion. They started to uh, normalize the relationship with Saudi Arabia, uh, negotiation with them and reopen the embassy uh, uh, and sent messages to Biden administration through Oman that, okay, we are ready to negotiate and and the other things. Uh, second, they tried to rebuild, retrain uh, the suppression machine, especially the difficulties between IRGC intelligence and Ministry of Intelligence. Especially, they found out that <clears throat> uh, uh, three years ago, in November 2019, only 1% of the members of Basij a militia and revolutionary guard had problem to suppress the people. But in a, a recent uprising of the people, uh, the figure jumped up to 65 to 70 percent, according to Ministry of Intelligence. 
They, uh, we had disobedience in many garrisons of revolutionary guard, and uh, uh, many volunteers of Basij didn't come to streets to confront the people. They went to the prisons and brought the thugs, the criminals, to the scene uh, to uh, uh, suppress the people. Uh, so the, the second part of their strategy was to rebuilding their forces. And the third was to suppress the people, to arrest anybody who have been uh, uh, active, to uh, create fairness in the society again, uh, and hope that the, uh, the people freeze again and go back to their home. Uh, I can say that right now, all three parts have been defeated. They didn't succeed. Uh, I don't go to the details, but just point to the last one, that the brave confrontation of the <clears throat> women of Iran in front of the imposed hijab that uh, is going on in Iran day by day uh, uh, is something important that now has, uh, uh, you know, banned the third part of their strategy. And they are really afraid for uh, the second phase of the uh, revolution that they are sure that the economic problems will join the social cultural problem of the people with this regime. Uh, what we are doing as the people of Iran, what the, uh, 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 as the activists in the scene, uh, uh, I can say in a brief that uh, we, we did four things. First, we looked back and uh, tried to find out that what was our weakness uh, and a strength point uh, 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 what what we did what where we made mistake because some of uh, some of our activists were arrested and now uh, are in jail second we found out uh, that uh, some of the uh, activists need to be retrained uh, so we are trying to train them again for uh, uh, by the tactics of civil resistance how to lead in every region. Third, uh, uh, we found out that we need uh, some more <clears throat> preparation. Uh, and the last one is designing campaigns that uh, uh, actually uh, connect the grand strategy based on those three pillars to tactics in the field. So. Uh, the, so far, uh, uh, we have agreed on nine different campaigns that uh, uh, at least one of them is outside Iran. Uh, it should be done outside Iran that we are working on that. Uh, uh, that uh, if it's necessary, I can talk about that, but not about the other eight ones. I'm going to ask I stop you about the one yeah. outside. Yeah, Mosin, <clears> thank <throat> you. I'm going to I'm going to ask you in just a little while about. Two things: transnational justice, uh, which you what, transitional justice, which you talked about before, uh, earlier before we went online, and this, the campaign outside of Iran. But what you pointed to, uh, uh, former Deputy uh, uh, Prime Minister Zanzigara, is something that uh, are, that uh, Vahid Beshti has been doing. He's been a one-man campaign in the United Kingdom, uh, bravely uh, uh, suffering 70, uh, 72-day hunger strike and then 169 days camping out outside the uh, British foreign ministry uh, to prevail upon Prime Minister Sunak and the foreign, uh, and the foreign minister and the foreign ministry uh, to prescribe IRGC. Uh, Vahid, I'm gonna to turn to you so, and share your thinking uh, with us in this campaign. What's the most important step in your view that the opposition needs to take today as we, uh, as we approach uh, the one year anniversary of Masa Amini's uh, death in September of 22. Uh, and tell us what, what you believe in, in, in the same answer, if you can. Hmm? It's one year. Yeah, it's one year uh, since Masa was killed. Uh, and, what, and what is your sense about what it's going to take to, 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 uh, for the tipping point of the UK government to uh, outlaw the IRGC in its entirety? Uh, thank you. Hi to everyone. And I really appreciate and thank you, Dan and JCPA, for hosting this great workshop and event. Uh, 
Um, and first of all, I, uh, if I may correct what uh, you just mentioned, this is not one man campaign. I wouldn't be here without the support of all Iranians. All Iranians from the moment that I put my tent in front of foreign office 169 days ago, they were around me, they were supported me. I couldn't last without their support. So this is Iranian, I would say, campaigns. And of course, even non-Iranians, we have Ukrainians, we have other British citizens who they are supporting me day by day to uh, take this campaign forward. As you witnessed, 100, 169 days ago, the case of IRGC completely forgotten in UK. It's gone on the shelf. Now as we're talking, is the most hottest topic in every uh, political, I would say, gathering. As you, as you all witnessed a few days ago, Home Secretary, because three times, as far as I understand, the foreign minister has been questioned by MPs and the Lords about my hunger strike and his position uh, regarding uh, prescription of IRGC. His response in all three times was this. Our priority is our national security and the safety and security of British nationals inside and outside of the country. Now, four or five days ago, our Home Secretary stated IRGC is the biggest threat against our national security in the UK, in our soil. So it's all on uh, foreign office and uh, shoulder at the moment. So we moved so far. I think this was the great step toward prescription. We have the majority, major, absolute majority of uh, politicians as we have Lord uh, Stuart Pollock here at the moment with us. He, you know, he's been a great, pillar, or can call it, great pillar of this campaign against IRGC, as he did before against, uh, against Hezbollah. So the, ca the campaign has been really uh, going well. Of course, it's not uh, easy. Um, each day we have different progress. But at the moment, I think uh, we are not far from prescription of IRGC in UK, as we saw the difference, and uh, actually we, we, can, we can call it the fight between foreign office and home office. Um, so uh, this was from the campaign side, what happened and uh, it was all because of the support of all Iranians, regardless of their point of uh, political point of view. They all supported this campaign so far. But what is the most important step, I would call it, at this very crucial moment for us? Because the victory of Iranians is not just for Iranians. It's not just for the region. It's for the world. Imagine, all of you, if you can just imagine one minute, the Iran, the, the, Iran, the democratic Iran, what's the effect of democratic Iran on the region and on the world, compared with this terrorist regime at the moment, ruling this great country and creating all these problems in the region and in the world. So, Mohsen Sazegare Aziz, uh, he stated the different tactics, different strategies and all this. But the most important step at this very crucial moment is the unity of our oppositions. I think, and this is what I have been repeating every day, we need all the opposition group. We have different political view. They, we have to pull all, put all our differences aside and at the moment focus only on overthrowing the regime. Because without overthrowing the regime, we don't have anything to fight for. Of course, after, the, after overthrowing the regime, all the different political view, all the different parties, they will fight, same as here. They will, in a, and to show their way that they think is the best way to run the country, run the Iran for the, for, for the future of Iran. 
But at the moment, we have to focus only on our fight against the regime, not fighting against each other. Each other. This is very important. And, and not deleting any group, any group. This is my position about the uh, what about the necessary step at this very important time of our fight. Vahid, thank you very much. I just want to ask you very quickly, Vahid, very sh uh, a sharp answer on this one. What we heard in the United Kingdom when I was there recently, and I had the pleasure of speaking with you and your lovely wife, Mati, who's been uh, equally uh, dedicated 24-7 uh, to, to, uh, to this uh, cause, uh, 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 is that the, the UK Foreign Office has said that if the IRGC is prescribed in the UK, that it will limit and compromise its diplomatic maneuverability inside Iran uh, with, the, with, with the regime. So the sense is that they don't want to cut off possible pathways or doors, if you will. Uh, and how would you answer that issue? This is something that's been asked of, of some British commentators and journalists that I've spoken with recently. That's great. First of all, let me uh, say something about Matty, about my wife. I couldn't do any of these things and Minister Gamblila reminded me in our meeting any of these things, even a day hunger struck without Matty being putting everything on this campaign. Matty from the day one, she was fully behind this campaign and running, I would say twice than me. So that's from Matty's side. But I answered this question many times to um, UK politicians. If we can go back to, I think if I'm right, it was 2013 when the Basijis attacked UK British embassy inside of Iran. And we had the embassy, we had embassy closed, I think for three years, but the communication was there. American, they didn't have embassy since 1979, but look at the communication is there. We prescribe Hezbollah and Hamas, but there is the uh, UK embassy is running in, uh, mm, what's the country of, I forgot the, uh, uh, the Lebanon? Uh, Lebanon, yes, in, in a, uh, sorry, in Lebanon. And the communication is there. So that's an excuse because, and I am telling you why they bring this excuse. The problem is Iran desk in our foreign office. We don't know who is sitting in around the table of Iran desk in foreign office. We don't know who is giving advice actually now regarding prescription of IRGC and Iran case to our foreign uh, minister and our foreign office. I saw few people, I can say it here, I saw few people in these 169 days who they come and go to foreign office, which I call them the Iranian regime lobbyist. So if those people are giving advice to our foreign office here, so of course they're gonna turn uh, back and bring these excuses. And Iranian, another excuse, which is really um, making everyone laugh is this. They said, if we prescribe IRGC, these terrorist organizations become, become more terrorist become more dangerous. So how a terrorist organizations become, become more terrorist? And if these organizations are not terrorist organization, or could be uh, ben, uh, President Benjamin, uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, if this is not a uh, terrorist organization, so they have to explain to us what is, an, uh, what is a terrorist organization. So these are the problems, and I answered this. Is not is it our communication, our part, political communication, would not be uh, cut with prescribing IRGC at all. This is a threat that IRGC always pose. But when we prescribe them, they change their ways. They won't change their ways because we continued with our appeasement policy for 44 years, and they got away each time with the ways, because we keep continue appeasing them. The only language this terrorist organization understand, actually the, the Iranian uh, regime in, in whole, the only language they understand is pressure, 
and a strong leadership. This is the only language they understand. They won't understand any other language and they won't respond to any other language. Hostage taking, I'll go this and then I close my um, uh, conversation with this. Uh, a hostage taking policy is one of the other excuses. They said, okay, if you prescribe them, they're gonna, uh, they not gonna hand uh, exchange the prisoners. I call them hostage. So hostage taking policy is their IRGC and Iranian regime main policy since 44 years ago. From the beginning, this was their first and main policy. So if we are going to continue with what they are asking from us through this uh, hostage taking, that's playing in the path that they laid for us, actually. Why they take hostage? Because that's, the, that's their ways to control us. So once for, once for all, we have to stand strong and prescribe this uh, terrorist organization. And then we all see how they change their ways. Well, there you go. So, Vahid, your point is that appeasement is a backfire. Appeasement is a backfire uh, 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 strategy or is a backfire tactic. I'm going exactly. to ask uh, Lord Pollock uh, uh, before I get to Fiamma and, uh, and, and my dear friend Brig Brigadier General Cooperwasser. Um, uh, Lord Stuart Pollock, would you, uh, now that Vahid, whom I had the pleasure of meeting through, through you, as a matter of fact, at the House of Lords, um, what, wh how, how significant was uh, Home Secretary Braverman's statement uh, in noting that the IRGZ poses the greatest single security threat, national security threat to Great Britain. How important was that uh, in, the, uh, in the pathway to having the IRG prescribed in, in Great Britain? Because it seems that if Great Britain serves as the example for the rest of Europe, um, there, it could be a domino effect in a positive sense in prescribing the organization. Oh, well, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. Um... Look, the, the work that Vahid has done in terms of leading by doing what he's done in terms of uh, not eating for a few days, it's, it's not, a, not a good Jewish thing not to eat. Uh, he, he, he did it for a long time. Um, he, he certainly has, has made people listen. But I actually, besides paying great tribute to him, uh, I actually want to pay tri tribute to somebody else who I just noticed is on, on the call uh, today, and that's um, a journalist in the United Kingdom called David Rose. David Rose is a, an investigative journalist for the Jewish Chronicle. And I would argue that actually the, the, the Suella Braverman um, statement has come because of the work he and the Jewish Chronicle have done in the only in the last number of weeks of exposing what is going on by or what the IRGC and others are doing in the UK at this moment. Um, and uh, he's exposed that every week in the last few weeks uh, in the Jewish Chronicle, which has then been picked up in the wider press. And then I think has resulted in Suella Braverman's statement. Suella, uh, as Home Secretary, uh, has been very strong on all this. And I, I was very, um, I felt very sort of comfortable, sadly, listening to John Bolton, because what John Bolton described uh, of what's going on in the UK, uh, it's almost as if the, the, the civil servants in the foreign office, uh, it's just sort of too difficult and we don't really want to move and we don't want to do anything. And I think what we need to do is just pure lobbying action like Vahid is doing, like many other parliamentar uh, parliamentarians are doing. The chairman of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, Elisa Kearns, has led on this too. It will happen. And I think a number of people said it. it's just how long it takes for it to happen. It took us ages with Hezbollah. Again, why? Because I think it's just easier for civil servants not to change. Um, the IRGC also have not changed. But uh, uh, I, 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 I also will, will just want to say something what, the, uh, again, David Rose has led on. A couple of weeks ago, he talked about, uh, there was a headline in the Jewish Chronicle about MPs demanding tough new sanctions on the Iranian regime. And this is to do with the, the as, and I, I, I quote, he said, the UN curbs on the regime's ballistic missile program will be lifted in October, along with separate UK and EU measures targeting the IRGC, Iran's defense ministry, its weapons manufacturers. This is gonna happen in October, why? While everybody's sleeping. 
while everybody's sitting there and de debating what to do. We, we need to be clear. So I, I think the pressure is beginning to tell. Um, and whilst I, 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 I end with where I began, I, I think Vahid has been an amazing leader on this. Uh, we, some parliamentarians have followed, but you know, parliamentarians like to talk. I think what David Rose and the Jewish Chronicle have done have now exposed it. Uh, and in such a way, we will get there. How long it takes, I think depends on all of us to continue putting on the pressure. Thank you. Lord Pollock. I want to turn, um, following Lord Pollock's uh, insight on the pathway in Britain to Merdan Marty Yusufani, uh, who's a, a friend, a colleague, president and CEO of Caspian Balestra Group. And Marty, for the last, uh, goodness gracious, four decades, you've been, uh, you've been taking uh, this, uh, this struggle behind the scenes. And, and as a matter of fact, I, I would call you the glue among the broad, uh, 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 the rainbow of uh, colors of the Iranian opposition between thought leaders and political leaders and cultural leaders, uh, academics, uh, which makes you unique uh, uh, and a very important element here. Uh, so before I turn to uh, Fiamma and to, uh, to Yossi, I'm gonna ask you, Marty, uh, help us understand what is the most effective way for, for the diaspora, meaning the, the Iranian people in the diaspora, as well as those of us in the West who want to connect with the Iranian people and help them uh, pave this pathway to democracy and freedom for their own future and their own society. Well, thank you for that, uh, Dan, kind words. Thank you for hosting this important uh, gathering. Just a quick little uh, correction. I previously served as a uh, senior counselor to Prince Reza Pahlavi, uh, as there may have been uh, other commentary. But uh, yes, it's a very important question. Uh, of course, as we heard today, uh, much is happening in Iran. The Iranian political theater is very, very complex, requiring experience, nuance. And uh, some of the conversation here today in terms of, of uh, various uh, policy recommendations um, are important to look at in a careful, nuanced way. For example, uh, uh, when we talk about the postcarding of the IRGC, which is a critical, uh, critical element here, it's also important to be cognizant of our immediate experience in Iraq uh, after the debathification, the vacuum causing havoc, and but of course, external forces taking advantage of that, namely the IRGC itself. Uh, so I think that conversation requires a, a, a close scrutiny, close debate uh, to see what are the actual uh, uh, effective ways of uh, doing what is right at the same time, making sure a, 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 a catastrophic uh, power vacuum is averted as well. Uh, the Italian foreign minister, uh, His Excellency uh, rightly said that the world needs to demonstrate the unwavering support uh, to the Iranian people, which leads to your question. Well, to the Iranian people, uh, having experienced 40 years of uh, uh, many waves, ups and downs, uh, to them it means, first and foremost, hands off, not in interfering, not pre-selecting, predefining any group or individual for uh, uh, that will give an impression to the Iranian people inside that somebody or a group has been selected, imposed on them. So that's very, very important uh, to establish because as Mr. Sarzavara said very well in detail, the Iranian revolution today has demonstrated that the people of Iran are the most important ally the free world has. And by that we mean when anybody walking into the streets of Tehran, Tabriz, Mashhad, even home, uh, one will immediately recognize that the people, especially our uh, valiant and, and courageous women, have already forced important change through their defiance of the hijab. Uh, uh, and mind you, without uh, leadership decentralized or 
Morrison said, uh, just today, uh, the symbol of this defiance, showing how critically important it is for the regime, just today, a few hours ago, President Raisi declared the regime's intention to fully push back on this defiance. Why? Because it is fundamentally the most important symbol the regime has. The day that goes, the regime has nothing to fall back. So symbolism is, is enormously critical here, and the Iranian people are showing their courage by doing that. Uh, when you look at what's happened, what's transpired uh, throughout the past few waves, the, the biggest wave being the Maksa revolution, uh, in fact, we see that the Iranian people are, are exercising and preparing for what should be called the moment supreme when it all comes down. To counter that, this practice with the people's growing confidence, the regime's argument is what? If we leave, you will have Syria, you will have Iraq, you will have Afghanistan, you have chaos. So to come back to the question, what is the best approach? In my view, and, and, and many of us who are looking at uh, methodologies uh, to address the Iranian uh, streets, the most important, the most important step that can be taken is to give the Iranian people hope inspiration. They need to hear that no, Iran will not fall apart. Iran will not turn into Syria. Why? Because we have plenty of highly successful, resourced, creative Iranians who are currently in exile, leading some of the most consequential brands, disrupting industries, and if those Iranians can do that within the complex competitive market economies of the world, they can and will be the same for Iran. We have the tools, we have the resources, we have the knowledge, we have the passion, we have the patriotism to help the Iranian people. That would inspire the Iranian people. That no, that we will not fall into chaos. And that we, meaning them, need to maintain their energy, their focus, and uh, uh, do the job themselves. We are here to support them, not interfere, but allow them to know there is something bright awaiting them. Do not listen to the regime. And that help is near and close, mind you by that, I mean that help can also be centered in the region. There is no reason the countries within the region, the day after Iran finds its rightful place in, among the community of nations, there is no reason attention, investment, trade cannot flourish. And that is the vision that the Iranian people can really hold on to and find the courage and find the inspiration uh, to uh, fast track the day off. So- uh, Yeah, Marty, that's perfect. Uh, I think that's a perfect message about fast tracking the day, the day after. Uh, with your permission, I, I wanna ask uh, my dear friend and colleague, uh, Yossi Kubrasser, uh, who was, uh, some years ago, he was the, the head of the intelligence uh, research uh, directorate, uh, research, and, research and assessment directorate of IDF intelligence. And one of his major foci was, has been the Iranian issue. Uh, uh, I'm sure, uh, correct on that. <laughs> right. True is true. Fact is fact. So, uh, uh, Yossi, I'm going to turn to you and, and, and ask you to share with us uh, uh, what is it that the, you know, what is it that that Israel and the Iranian people, Israel and the West, 
can do to help the Iranian people uh, move down move down this path? And you, uh, your rich experience, I mean, you've been this in for several decades. Well, first of all, really, I try to, to, to have all these people speak about this issue. It's such an important issue. And the, the fact that we took upon ourselves here in the JCP to hold these conferences is really amazing. Thank you, Jim, for holding. Thank you. Uh, secondly, uh, in this respect of what can we contribute, I must say that I made prepared myself and knew that you're going to ask me this question and prepared a short note here. In it, I put seven times the word hope. And now Marty just took it. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> I think that uh, the most important thing that uh, we have to uh, provide the Iranians is the hope. We can help them have hope. And uh, because if you look back, all the efforts until now did not bear the fruits everybody was we were looking for. Because the Iranian opposition never had the hope that they're going to be successful. They were uh, not united enough. They were not mm. confident enough. Uh, they, they, they didn't have the, the, the belief that they are going to be successful. They wanted very much to succeed. They were ready to sacrifice. And we were all impressed by what was uh, presented here by Vahid and by uh, uh, Mohsen uh, Sazagara. And, uh, these people really made a big sacrifice. But nevertheless, something helped stood between them and success. And I think one of the reasons uh, this feeling that the West is not behind them and they cannot rely on the West. Uh, Israel may be more, but, uh, but not enough either. And uh, is Israel by itself able to provide a, uh, the, the hope, I'm not sure. So, uh, so what needs to be done is to convince the world to provide Iran, Iranian people with the hope necessary to move forward. Now, the first thing that should be done in order to provide this hope is to put Iran high on the agenda, maybe the first thing on the agenda. Because first of all, it's the right thing to do for the Iranian people and for the well-being of the, the region and for the well-being of the world. Secondly, it's the uh, right thing to do because it is in the interest of everybody. Now, everybody understands what are the repercussions of not doing that. Uh, we see what chaos is uh, going in all those places governed by Iran, including Iran itself. We see now what is the dangerous impact of what Iran is doing in Ukraine. We see uh, what uh, can happen to Israel because of uh, not holding uh, uh, the Iranian uh, uh, leadership uh, to its uh, responsibility to what's going on around us with Hezbollah and with everybody else. That's, uh, that's why we need to put uh, Iran first on the agenda. Unfortunately, if you look at what the Americans have uh, recently published as their uh, annual intelligence assessment, Iran was hardly mentioned. If you look at what, uh, when you see Blinken or uh, Biden who speak about the situation in the world, forget about the United Kingdom. Uh, Iran is at best uh, mentioned in the end. And uh, this is the wrong approach, and this is, uh, we have to, to try and change it and put Iran on the first, uh, the first list of uh, priority uh, when it comes to international attention. Uh, this is going to help in Ukraine, this is going to help in Syria, this is going to help in uh, Lebanon, everybody is worried about what's going to happen in Lebanon, this is going to help in, uh, in Yemen, this is going to help anywhere. Secondly, we have to show readiness to assist the, uh, the opposition by putting pressure on the regime. Uh, some more sanctions are necessary. Uh, uh, Stuart Pollack spoke about uh, October. October is tomorrow morning. We're going to take off sanctions instead of putting more sanctions we're going to, to ease the sanctions. So this is simply ridiculous. It's uh, totally ignoring the real situation on the ground. It's, it's so uh, amazing. Uh, we should need to, we should need to put more sanctions and one of them is the hope is going to be built by putting the uh, uh, IRGC on the list of uh, uh, terror organizations that's uh, one of the elements that is necessary in this respect uh, hope is going to be built if we show that we really care about the Iranian opposition by allowing them to have more communications that they need in order to reach the people of Iran inside so uh, 
funny, the, even in Ukraine, people uh, rely on uh, Elon Musk, Starlinks, you know, to do that. But uh, let's let's give the Iranian opposition as well some uh, cap better capabilities to reach uh, to reach home and have an impact over there. Uh, you provide them with technology. Technology, yes. Hope is going to be uh, built on the facilitating the Iranian opposition, the uh, framework with the framework to cooperate and overcome the difficulties it has, as uh, Marty described them. We have to, somebody has to help them in that. And uh, because we, we saw that until now, they never managed to overcome. They are trying from time to time, there are attempts, but uh, not uh, successful enough. If the West intervenes in this respect, then it's going to be something that looks uh, different than what we have seen until now. And, uh, and hope is going to be built by providing the Iranian people uh, confidence that in the future, the entire world is going to help them overcome the potential chaos that's going to be the after, in the aftermath of uh, the fall of the regime. Because every Iranian is very afraid of that. You know, nobody wants to see a new Syria and so on and so forth. We need to give them guarantees that this is not going to happen. The world is going to be there for them. And one of the members of the world community that's going to be first to assist uh, is going to be Israel. And I think this was uh, mentioned and uh, emphasized during uh, Riza Pahlavi's uh, visit here. And uh, yes, we are, we are able and uh, ready and eager to help the Iranian people once there is a change in Iran. And uh, unfortunately, as I said, this is not has not happened until now, even though what's going on in Iran after the Massa story is, uh, is so appealing for something like that. Everybody sees that the, the, the people of Iran have uh, given up uh, any shred of uh, support to, the, to this regime. The, as uh, Sazigora said, even inside the, the regime's own security forces, there is some uh, erosion. So it's, uh, it's such a big opportunity that was not taken seriously enough by the international community. And I think we, with the little we can do here from JCPA, but with the kind of excellent people we have on this talk, uh, can do much more and uh, will do more you know, in order to bring a change. That's right. Thank you, Yossi. In fact, with Yossi and, and Fiamma and Harold Road and Effie and, and Aviram, and, and Yechiel, we have a, a team here at JCPA that provides an intellectual and strategic home in a neutral address for the consideration of all of these issues, which today has to be very short because we're time, we're time challenged. But um, you know, th this is a mission for us, uh, uh, this dual pathway, uh, as we continue uh, uh, to you know, to offer uh, this type of thinking and action. Just by the way, because I have another Zoom. Meeting. You have another, you're over Zoom. <laughs> you're over Zoom. That's fine. Thank you for, for sharing the comments. Thank you. Thank you, you everybody. For really I'm going to turn to Fiamma. Uh, Fiamma, I remember your book, The Caliph and the Ayatollah, that you wrote uh, on the Iranian issue. And, and you're really focusing now uh, where, where Mosin uh, uh, talked about uh, the, the human courage and Vahid talked about it and Marty talked about uh, you're going to talk about the, the issue that I already see in women, the violation of, of, of women's rights, which which actually Harold and Effie reminded me that Masa's real name is Zina. Uh, uh, I said it correctly, right? Okay. Yeah, it's Zina. Uh, 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 and the, the courage that she's shown uh, and stood for and her legacy continues. So uh, share with us a few ideas. We're a little bit time yeah, pressed. I know, I know that I have to speak very shortly. And this is what I will do. Let me tell you that when I wrote that book, I was a divided person because... When you spoke about Iran here, it was one thing. And when you spoke about Iran in Europe, in Italy, and wherever uh, was not Israel, it was a completely different feeling. Nobody gave the importance we gave as Israel to the issue. So I wrote that book just to explain how it was fatal for all of the world to give importance and to understand this terror uh, regime how it was threatening all the world and in which way. So I, I did it. And uh, still, it was very hard to be understood. It was the time when Mogherini uh, that was wearing a veil in front of all the world. It was the time uh, when Borrell, uh, the other that followed her, 
responsible for foreign affairs in the European Union said, okay, we know that Iran is uh, threatening the, the life of all the Jews that live in Israel. We have to live with that. Do you remember that? That was the time when this was done. Well, this kind of thing don't happen anymore. If uh, Mogherini, thanks God, doesn't appear in the political scene and Borrell speaks a different lang language while, uh, while uh, the, the, it, it, also the European Union is now discussing the issue of putting the IRGC out of law. Um, my idea, I'm, well, I'm so honored to be here. It's the first time I, I, I really feel that there is something changing in the, this, this group of people discussing here from all the Giulio, uh, you most of all, uh, Zazek, Zazegara and the other uh, Iranian Bahid. friends and the British, Raid and Safadi and the, uh, the other British friends. I mean, uh, it's a different situation. Things are moving. And why are they moving? There are two basic reasons why. why one is Putin. The fact that Iran gave uh, weapons to Putin cannot be forgiven by the European Union and by all the world. We have to keep it in mind all the time and push this subject and describe what does it mean? How is this big group of powers, including China, that threaten the world and Iran is in the middle of this group? This is something that start to be understood by the, the Western powers. We didn't have the attention of the Western power. Now we have it because of this. Now about women. Women is the other universal subject that everybody understands today. You know, women, life, freedom are three words that everybody knows, okay? And when we speak now about women, I wanna tell you one thing. We must make clear one subject about this issue. And it is that women are not persecuted because. They are persecuted because of the regime. And who is the soul of the regime? The IRGC. And the IRGC must be put out of law. Why do I say that? When I was the deputy president of the Commission of Foreign Affairs of the uh, Italian, I invited the fiance of Neda, the other girl that was killed by the besiege. Now, another story, uh, and I invited him, he spoke there in the Commission of Foreign Affairs. And it was very much me. I understood plenty of things from because you know stories explain all about Max Amini. Here we have the same story. She was kidnapped by forces of police, brought to state office by officials, killed by state office. And now, after all this came clear, not only that the state office have kept persecuting women in the street. But also when uh, there has been uh, the terrible tragic episode of 1,200 little girls poisoned by the regime, nobody could understand the story, but through the words of a doctor that just visited one of the girls and said, well, these girls have been poisoned by a very complicated gas that cannot have been produced by anybody else, by somebody that can buy important things and prepare them and give it to the girls. And then you know what happens today? You know what happens today? You know that since the 16th of July, the spokesperson of the Iran police, Said Mutazeri al mahdi announced the return of the petrol to enforce compulsory veiling. It was something that the regime said that had been canceled, but it goes back to it and goes back to it with all of this fire pyramid, pyramid of fire pyramid. The pyramid is involved in this persecution. The pyramid and on top the, of the pyramid with all of its uh, ideological and the technological uh, strength, there is the IRGC. So that's the reason why we must put out the IRGC first and foremost, because this will give a lot of hope as our friends uh, were saying here to the people in the streets. And this will push again on the motor of the, of the people that wants to be on the side of the girls. Okay, I'll that's stop a, That's here. very, very well put, very compact and, and a sharp I'm point. I'm a journalist. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> you, you, you're able to do the elevator messaging. Very well done. Yeah, I mean, you're also a scholar. Uh, and, and in fact, I'd like to, to pick up what uh, 
Fiamma said in turn to a member of parliament of the French parliament, Hadrian Gomi. If Hadrian, are you uh, with us? Did you have you survived the last hour and a quarter? <laughs> Is Adrian with us? Yeah. No, I want to. I want to call on, on Harold as well to come and you can come and join us here. Uh, in, but but uh, come on and if if Hadrian is on the call, I would like um, to turn to to Hadrian uh, if if he is here. If not, let me just turn to Dave Wormser for a second. Dave, are you yeah. with us? Yeah, I'm here. Oh hi, Dave. Um, what's what's your sense um, uh, from where you, you sit as a former advisor to the vice president on Middle East, and 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 you were the the go to. Uh, advisor on Iran as well during uh, the presidency of uh, uh, of uh, George W. Bush uh, uh, 43 and, and Vice President Cheney for eight years. Um, what's your sense about the uh, the critical role that the United States led Western alliance should be playing right now in order to set uh, to reset uh, the, the the moral standard, the moral clarity for for the Western charge on this issue right now? Yeah, I, you know, just about the United States. I mean, I'm not terribly sanguine about this administration getting it right, but we'll leave that for another day. Uh, I'm also a little worried about other administrations. I remember the uh, Trump himself. I mean, John Bolton had the correct views on how to deal with Iran, but even the president, in, in, and, it, and this gets to the core of what I, I want to bring across, which is the Iranian regime operates on manipulation. Uh, those who know Iran constantly tell the story of Sherazad and how she manipulated the storytelling in order to take the soul uh, over the soul of the uh, much more powerful absolute dictator, the uh, Shahriar, and how in the end that was uh, that was how Iran's strategy works is manipulation. There are a set of rules. When those rules don't fit Iran, they change the playbook and they operate by another set of rules. And that's something Vahid said is that we play on the path that the Iranian regime lays for us. And they change the path all the time to suit their thing. So it's a manipulative structure of strategy that the Iranians use to essentially take over our soul and use it against us. And there are several areas in which they have focused most. One is that there are three separate baskets, and this is the one I, I, even President Trump fell into, that there are three separate baskets. There's the human rights issue, there's the terror issue, and then there's the weaponry issue, which includes missiles and nuclear weapons. And that you can, you, you know, we have our interests on the nuclear weapons, or we have our interests on the terrorism, or we have our interests on human rights, but they play these things off each other. They'll concede on one at a moment to get what they want on the other. And the key here is what John Bolton said, which is it's part of a whole. We cannot let them define for us these various parts and play off against each other. Because if we really focus, for example, on the nuclear, they are going to concede for a moment on the nuclear in order to shut down the internal threat they face from the Iranian people. And that and, they, and so they will. So essentially, if we look, if we are looking for a deal with this regime, they will play us for that deal and they will play us for whatever way suits them. And that's the problem I think President Trump had is he still thought there could be a deal. And I think we need to align with the Iranian people who are sending a very clear signal now. There are no deals anymore. This regime has crossed the line and it's not we, we're, we need to be done with it. We need to focus now on moving beyond this regime, not moderating it. The second area that the, so the first area is, this is part of a whole. You cannot barter one area for another because the Iranians will manipulate that to their advantage and we won't even know they're shifting the rules. The second area is chaos. They threaten chaos because they know we don't like chaos. For some reason, the West has become so obsessed with stability, that even internally in Iran, that we think that everybody is obsessed with stability. The truth is the Iranian regime is the primary agent of chaos, and it's the primary agent of chaos internally to Iran. They are the originators, and they tap in most to this idea of the breakup of Iran, because they want to make the point to the Iranian people that Après moi, le deluge. You know, after me, you have Syria. 
So you want Syria, you want half a million, a million people killed, uh, 10 million refugees, by all means, get rid of us, the Ayatollahs, because we hold it all together. That is their manipulation of us. They are the ones who are trying to create separatism in order to threaten us uh, and, and, and appeal to our sense of, 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 uh, of uh, uh, instability regionally and then appeal in the same way to our sense that maybe we can destabilize them. So they are literally manipulating us into a trap. And the third and the most dangerous is always the reform or whether moderate hardliners or there are rogue elements of the Iranian regime that did either take our Navy uh, so, uh, uh, sailors hostage a, a decade ago or whatever, that there are, there's no command and control of the Iranian regime and that therefore whatever happens could be explained by some rogue guy playing politics. Uh, that is another manipulative aspect. So I, I, I think the West's most important thing is to set the right framework internationally to help the Iranian people. And to do that, we have to understand that we are being constantly manipulated by this regime and that we have to take control of that. And instead, we have to become the manipulator or we have to become, uh, just to finish, Azar Nafizi once told me the story of playing chat, of strategy with the Iranian regime is like playing chess with a gorilla. Uh, that at the moment that you've laid your wonderful plan down and you were about to say checkmate, uh, the gorilla leans over and eats your king. Just takes the king off the board and eats it. What do you do? You're paralyzed because the rules have suddenly been suspended. You don't know what rules to play by at that point. With Iran, the best policy the United States can take, and frankly, in the absence of the United States, Israel, Japan, all sorts of countries around the world can form a coalition. Uh, European countries, many of them are beginning to get it right, can form a coalition to somewhat replace the United States for the moment until we get our act again together. But we have to be the gorilla. We have to tell the Iranian regime and signal the Iranian regime, you don't know the rules we're going to play by. We play by rules of morality, but beyond that, you don't set our rules. We will set the rules and we will change them like you do. And we will make life very unpredictable for you. The Iranian regime cannot digest that un unpredictability because you cannot manipulate unpredictability. You know, anyway, David, I'll give it at that. when the former uh, American administration uh, decided to uh, invoke a maximum pressure campaign and pulling out of the JCPOA, that seemed to be an example of what you're talking about, about remaking the rules as you go along. Yeah, and killing Soleimani was. And killing Soleimani Absolutely. clearly was, which, which actually uh, defied all of the classic rules uh, that the West had warned that there was going to be a major outbreak, uh, outbreak of warfare in the Middle East. And in fact, nothing happened whatsoever. So that was in a way a proof text um, it, it, to, to your observation now, which I think also, David, has a cultural aspect to it. Uh, Harold, uh, Dr. Harold Rohn, who's sitting next to us and a fellow at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs has been talking about culture. We talk about manipulation of, uh, as culture. I know that Effie Dardashi has made this point. Harold, you make this point. I wanna uh, just turn to you, Harold, and talk about culture. You're the culture guy. And you've been studying culture since you lived in Tehran yes. in, until 1979 uh, for, for a period in the late 70s. Help us understand what Dave Wormser is saying by translating it into the, the milieu of, of, Iran, of understanding Iranian negotiating strategy and culture in order to allow the, the, the Iranian people, just in a couple of minutes that we're to, so we can maintain our, our timing, uh, maybe take a couple of questions from members of the press, media who are, are, are participating with us. What about culture, Harold? Well, one of the most important things is to try to understand Iran as Iran understands itself. And that is, it's not a country. It's a culture, it's a civilization. We unfortunately, we have many people in the West who are really interested in uh, the ethnic breakup of Iran. Now, they write, they talk about this, some of our um, experts on the Islamic world. And what is interesting is that every time they write an article that, uh, that so-and-so advocates the breaking up of Iran, the Iranian government publishes the article. Is they, they, they spread it as widely as they can in Iran. Why? 
because whatever your ethnicity is, by and large, there is a an under, my, underlying loyalty to the concept of the land of Iran. Let me give you a proof, or I'll give you just a few incidents that I said when I when I lived in Iran. Um, the inventor of modern Iranian nationalism is an Azeri, an Azerbaijani. Now, we have no clue as to which, uh, how the largest groups in Iran, um, how many there are. Everybody floats all sorts of statistics. All I can tell you is the Soviets had been marvelous at this. And it wouldn't surprise me if the group that we call Azeris, Azerbaijanis, are the, is the largest group, even more than Persians. But the moment that people start talking about, we need an independent Azerbaijan, let me tell you what, how, how I experienced this. How can an Azeri invent Iranian nationalism? Azeris, by Western understanding of things, Azeris are Turks, they're not Persians. But the truth is, these, these people are basically one group. They are both Shiites, and together they are the overwhelming majority of the country. And they're people who've been advocating Azeri separatism. And again, the Iranian government publishes everything. Well, let me tell you how the, uh, how the Azeris understand that they are, in fact, the true Iranians, even though they speak Turkish today, Azeri Turkish. It's simple. They invented this myth that when in the year 1401, a, a, a conqueror from Central Asia, which is a Turkic speaking place, um, conquered Iran, he hated all things Turkish and he cut out 400,000 tongues of people who spoke Persian. And that's why they went and their, their descendants spoke Azeri Turkish. Now, this may sound crazy to us, but that's how they understand it. From my own experience, the first time I went to Iran, I knew Persian grammar, but I knew Turkish much better. And how do I communicate in Tehran? I found that probably about eight in 10 people in the capital spoke a beautiful Turkish. Um, so is the capital of Iran, which is Persian, why are so many people speaking um, a form of Turkish. Now, the leader of Iran, Khamenei, the, the, the best translation in any language is Führer, like the, the Hitler's title. He is the supreme leader and he decides everything in the end. There is no democracy in Iran. Khamenei's, excuse me, Khamenei's father is an Azeri, an Azerbaijani, Turk, but he is a Shiite and he's Iranian galore. Let me tell you just one more little story. When, before the Soviet Union broke up, Azeris, Azerbaijani, Soviet Azerbaijanis, the people who began, who eventually became the independent country of Azerbaijan, um, they would come to Washington and they would come to speak with me. I, these are people that I knew from various conferences and their problem was that they, maybe something like three quarters of the Iran of the Azerbaijani speakers in the world live in Iran. And these people who now had an independent state, Azerbaijan, were meeting all these Iranian Azeri, people, Azeris, and they were saying, you know, we need to have one state. And the Iranian Azeris said as follows, we, yes, we're Azeri just like you are, but we are Iranian. The last thing they wanted to do was leave Iran. In fact, some of the Iranian Azeris suggested to the Azeris of uh, uh, independent Azerbaijan, just north of Iranian Azerbaijan, that why don't you join Iran too? Now, this doesn't make sense to the Western mind, but it sure as hell makes sense to the Iranian mind. The worst thing we can do is try to break up the country. The government wants us, as I said before, it wants us to say these things because people don't want the chaos that could come afterwards. They, they feel that they are one. Iran has been ruled by Azerbaijani Turks for what, at least since the 1500s. 
that's it. And so this is just in the question, the practical idea, what we should do is that we respect the Iranian culture. We respect this great history. Now the Israeli leaders and some of the American leaders have said how much they respect Iran and all this Iranian culture. And we want you to be again, part of the international community. We, we admire you immensely. That is the bottom line here. And if our goal is to get to the people, which is what most of the speakers today spoke about, it is absolutely essential that we use their mindset to get what they want done, which in the end is what we want done. That's a exactly, free Iran. That, that's exactly the point, uh, Harold, is that uh, what we're trying to do at the JCPA is to think the way the region thinks, the Iranian people think, not the way we think. The great Bernard Lewis uh, was a teacher of mine, and I got met him only through you and whenever, Fiamma. Whenever, uh, whenever. Uh, used to say, let's think the way they think, not the way we think, and let's stop mirroring. What, what Bernard used to call mirroring is projecting Western mindset onto non-Western peoples. Uh, can, can summarize this beautifully. In a marriage, men don't think like women and women don't think like men. If you really want to get your message across or a desire across, you got to try to think of it the way the other side is thinking about it. And that's what we need to do here. Okay, well, that's a, that's a great way of summing up this particular workshop. If there are any questions or any members of the, of the media watching and, and want to ask a question of our uh, respondents, we have, uh, yeah, can you just identify yourself? You should go. No. Yeah. Uh, oh, Jeremy Sakharov. Uh, agrees regarding the designation of the IRGC. The Khomeini is definitely an important inflection point, but the key factor remains the Iranian nuclear program has never been advanced as it is now. What diplomatic strategy would the speakers propose in preventing Iran's nuclear threshold status becoming even more advanced and, and weaponized? I, I see that Marty Yusufani is writing an answer uh, to, uh, to uh, Mr. Sakharov. Thank you for that question, Jeremy. Appreciate it. Uh, and Marty is, is writing. Is there another another question? Someone raised a hand. Okay. David Rose raised his hand of the Jewish Chronicle. Uh, David. Hi, David. David. Harold, lovely to see you, and and great to see Dave Wormser on this seminar too. Old friends. Um, I was very struck by Dave's comments uh, about uh, eating the king, taking Iran by surprise. And clearly, uh, in terms of rewriting the rules of this game, prescribing the IRGC is a very useful and concrete step that uh, European nations, including my own, should take. But I want to ask about something else. I've been told recently by experts on nuclear, Iran's nuclear weapons program, particularly David Albright in Washington, that a gap has opened up between Israel's bunker busting uh, kinetic capability to destroy Iranian nuclear facilities and the defenses that those nuclear facilities now possess. Now, we know that a couple of years ago, the United States successfully tested the new uh, uh, penetrating weapon called the GBU-72. Thus far, as I understand it, the Israeli Air Force only has access to a much earlier and less powerful model, the um, GBU-28. Um, if we want to talk about concrete steps, making available the GBU-72 to Israel would clearly have uh, an enormous impact. And I wondered if perhaps you, Harold and Dave, who've worked inside these areas in, in Washington and Ambassador Bolton could briefly speak to A, whether that's likely to happen. I know that the Israeli defense establishment has been asking for it. That's been reported by the international defense media. But, you know, what are the sort of hurdles that have to be overcome before uh, the Congress, as I understand it, which, which Congress would have to do, would, would give approval? How, and how important might that be? Dave Wormser, can you handle that question? Oh, Dave. Um, yeah. Um... Well, I, I think that, that, that the hurdles uh, are not that many. It's a question of just galvanizing and, uh, and mobilizing the various leaderships. Uh, 
I think it's there. I, the Congress is, I think, quite there. You don't, you don't need to have, um, you don't need to do a lot of work to convince even a significant portion of the Democratic leadership and a significant portion of the Republican leadership to go ahead with some sort of a congressional resolution. But I, that doesn't move a weapon. What moves a weapon, I think, uh, is really a political military branch question. You have a system in the U.S. government to do it, then Congress has to approve it and so forth. Uh, I'm not quite sure what's holding it up and why the United States wouldn't. Well, I do see why the United States wouldn't do it because they don't want. Ultimately, I think the United States is a fundamental, despite everything with the with the uh, cooperation with the Israelis militarily, I think it is a fundamental policy of the State Department's bureaucracy, not that the, the primary concern is an Israeli strike. So they don't want to enable an Israeli strike. So ultimately, I think the thing that really has to be cracked is this fundamental view gripping the foreign policy establishment in the United States. It's the worst thing that could happen is if the Israelis reach that point where they have to act. There's some sort of an apocalyptic mystique surrounding that eventuality, which I've never quite understood, uh, certainly don't accept. But I think that is the argument that has to be cracked to get the bureaucracy or overpowered, to get the bureaucracy to begin to do its part to move this weapon forward. Um, by the way, the one thing, though, I would say is uh, I don't know what Israel has. And I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't assume anything about what they don't or do have. Uh, yes, weapons, American weapons, there's a paper trail as to what they have internationally, namely the United States, Israel, it's a trade, so there's, there's, there's documentation. But what Israel internally has developed, I have no idea what they have. And I'm not sure anybody ought to count on what they do or don't have. Uh, if, if, uh, but I doubt, I doubt the Israelis are operating at this point fully on a bluff. So uh, if they say they can do something, my sense is they probably can. Uh, and if I were Iran, I'd, I'd consider that option. That, 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 that's, so at any rate, that's, that's what I would say about that specific military question. But again, the nuclear issue has to now be put in the framework of all the problems, the human rights, namely freedom and, and the missiles and uh, the chaos. The United States has to depart from everything we've done in the last 40 years and focus on bringing down the regime. That is going to be the only real uh, NPT, non-proliferation treaty solution to this. As a, you know, Dave, uh, uh, Richard Kemp has said numerous times in, in uh, you know, the former uh, British commander in Afghanistan of British forces, has said numerous times, and Harold reminds me of the uh, of, uh, of Richard Kemp's declaration that Israel can do it if it needs to do it, uh, and has both the political uh, moral will as well as the capabilities. So that's uh, just uh, here the messenger, of what Richard has said on, on very frequent uh, appearances. So that's just to put an exclamation point on the points that you're making, and thank you for that uh, eloquent and, and uh, uh, well thought out uh, explanation. By, by the way, a valid question to ask is, should Israel rely on America to do it? Or is this something Israel should do for its own interests on its own? The, the consensus in Israel is, if America will take part and help, by all means. But I, I think that question should be put on the table. Is that really what Israel... Would it actually serve Israel's interests to rely on the United States? Yeah, that would be it. And it opens the question for the paper. If I can just jump in here and add to this important conversation, of course, we, we know that uh, any, any military action in this environment will be catastrophic in terms of the energy level of the revolution because, A, it will divide uh, a united uh, uh, revolution, the spirit and the energy of it, and, and second, would allow the regime to monstrously uh, crush under the guise of invasion and so forth. It's a very, very uh, delicate and complex uh, 
situation, knowing that there is a red line beyond which uh, the world cannot tolerate. Uh, so that comes actually to the question that was part of the consent. Uh, what is the uh, an appropriate policy? The problem is that the shifting, constantly shifting uh, the policy, primarily in Washington, uh, which has been a transactional base, uh, really needs to look at making the pain threshold so high politically, strategically, and economically uh, that, that the regime cannot continue to play its very, very masterful, clever uh, policy of constantly moving the, the, the goalposts and uh, basically spinning the world along. So uh, there's a fundamental uh, policy uh, uh, paradigm shift that needs to be looked at uh, on a global level. You can't have a one block putting maximum pressure, another block using uh, uh, national interests to conduct economic transactions and split up. The regime has been masterful in splitting up the, the, the Western world into different blocks. So, we will leave that for the, for the uh, national security policy uh, masters like David Warren's report. Yeah, Marty, we'll continue that discussion. You know, we're, we're as, as uh, working together to plan the upcoming uh, working group meetings uh, in this continuation of uh, in, in what we call an international uh, a campaign uh, of, uh, of thought leaders, uh, both from within Iran and from, uh, from where we are now uh, and in the West. So we look forward to doing that. If I can just thank, I'd like to thank everyone, um, Minister, uh, Minister Gila Gamliel, uh, thank you ever so much for your opening comments and uh, uh, Your Excellency Ambassador uh, Tertzi, former Foreign Minister of Italy, thank you very much for your incisive uh, thinking here and for many years of that thinking. And thank you for uh, actually being one of the engines together with Fiamma putting this up, uh, suggesting that we urgently put this uh, continuation of our our ongoing uh, policy and uh, policy series of, of Iran on Iran to, uh, together, uh, and uh, as well as Ambassador Bolton, uh, thank you ever so much uh, from Jerusalem to Washington, and all of our uh, esteemed Iranian guests, Mohsen, Sanzigara, uh, Vaid Beshti, uh, Marty Osafani, uh, very much indebted to you for your thinking, and we look forward to continuing uh, to expand the strategic aperture of our conversations on both dual tracks about what we need to do now and what the Iranian people need to do to take uh, their future of freedom and democracy into their hands uh, and uh, what we can do in the international community to help. Uh, so uh, thank uh, everyone as well, Dr. Dave Wormser, Yossi Cooperwasser, Fiamma Nerenstein, Harold Rode, uh, and, uh, and Lord Stuart Pollack, uh, for being uh, such wonderful respondents here uh, in this uh, workshop that we've had today. Thank you everyone for your patience and thank you uh, Effie Dardashti for, for, for joining us. And also we have JP, JCPA senior staff uh, and scholars and Aviram Bilashi who's uh, survived an hour and 45 minutes, our great uh, security and communications and diplomacy for the Arab world Daniel. expert Daniel. and tears ashore. Uh, who's done such a great job together with uh, Uva Bendor in being the senior coordinators for today, especially in August, which is the great month of holidays for everybody in Israel. Uh, and of course, Daniel Levine, uh, or Levin, who has made everything here possible, our technical wizard uh, and uh, director of, uh, of all of our, uh, all of these events uh, from a technical standpoint. Thank you, thank you so much. And thank you to Heal Light, our director, Jack. You guys. It's a really pleasure having everyone here. We look forward to being, this is a big family here and, and we are again dedicated to the freedom, security and democracy of the Iranian people. And that would be a central focus of what we're doing here at Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs going forward in our capital and other capitals around the world. Thank you all very much. We'll have a brief on this, a summary brief that we'll issue to everyone. Uh, and this recording will be available uh, to everyone uh, here. Please uh, be in touch with us by email. Uh, you can send it to uh, diker at jcpa.org, d-i-k-e-r at, J -I -K -E -R at jcpa .org, uh, and I'll be happy to pass it on to our staff, and we will have the recording sent to you. God bless everyone. Thank you ever so much.
and look forward to seeing you. Thank you.